Uh, thanks for listening. Excited to be here. Uh, my name is Connor Flanagan, and today I'm presenting on the embodied model hypothesis, followed up and beginning with some conversations about hypnosis, mirror neurons, and how they tie into this uh, new idea. So starting off with the, the broad question of, well, what makes you do what you want to do? What makes you want what you do? What makes you desire things? It's a, it's a question that seems very obvious. It seems very simple. But when we think about it, uh, it feels like these are unknown desires. What makes you want to pursue a career, um, choose a lover, uh, hang out with a certain friend? Uh, we, we can give rationalizations, but there, there have been some theories that I'm going to discuss later in the presentation that may give some clarity into this question uh, and potentially the mechanism via psychedelics work in the brain. And that seems like a really, really disparate bridge that we're going to cross, but we're going to do it together. And we're going to go through uh, a few interesting steps to get there. So first, let's start off with like, what is this even about? What are we, what are we here for? And I'm here today to present the embodied model hypothesis, which is pretty much a connection of existing research um, in fields outside of psychedelics that I want to bring into the psychedelic community so we can have discussions about mainly interdividual psychology in the work of Rene Girard and the subsequent neuroscience research in mirror neurons that accompany it. And what would this do? So what, what's the point of this hypothesis? Why, is, why do I think it's important? Why does it matter for you? Um, I think it can help answer some important questions in psychedelics. So why is, the, why is intention so massively important in therapeutic practices? Why does it matter so much for us? Uh, why does an entropic brain or, a, you know, the, the existing grand uh, unifying theories of psychedelics actually can stop addiction, can decrease depression? Why does that happen? Um, the feeling of other and the, the versatility of psychedelic therapy. Now, I'm not going to be able to go into all the, the in-depth research here today, but what I will do is create uh, an overall gliding outline towards the hypothesis, uh, and so that can maybe lead into a paper later. So, uh, where do we start? So the discovery of mirror neurons has been a massive step forward in the field of psychology. Um, every neuroscience major probably knows a little bit about these, but to be, uh, to, to, you know, reduce them to something, they allow you in the brain to simulate what someone else is doing. So when you see another behavior, your brain will actually have almost identical activity to what they're doing. You pick up a cup, your brain has a very similar response to maybe if you were picking up a cup. And so uh, it's, they've been predicted to be like the, the DNA for biology, mirror neurons will be like that for psychology. And they're the, the basis of our presentation today. Uh, and they're very, very interesting because they allow us to imitate, leading us to Rene Girard. Now, R Rene Girard is a, a fascinating man, a polyglot who really has worked spanned across anthropology, psychology, uh, psychiat uh, psychi uh, like, you know, basically psychology, and uh, also theology. And he's the foundation of our presentation today. And his theory of mimetic theory is absolutely mind blowing. And so we're gonna get into what that actually is. So mimetic theory is the premise that our desires do not come from ourselves, but they come from other people. So let's say, you know, you, you really want, uh, you really want to go after a certain, uh, a mate, you have, there's a girl or a guy that you really, really like, where does that come from? Um, Rene Girard will say that oftentimes that comes from another person, that we imitate our desires for who we want to be, what we want in the world, and that this can have some consequences. One of those consequences is that uh, we'll have rivalry. When two people want the same thing, the desire eventually disattaches from the object and attaches to the model or the rival. An example of that would be maybe um, a model in, in this kind of girl scenario. I, I look up or I kind of admire my friend and he's, he's dating a girl. And maybe I, I start to have feelings for her because I want to be like him. So I emulate his desire. I imitate him. And these things happen all the time in classic love stories, you know, Romeo and Juliet, the things, uh, you know, lots of Shakespearean plays. And, and it's very fascinating because he not only states that there's this rivalry, but that this rivalry can lead to a lot of actual mental illness and emotional disorders. When we have this embodiment, this internal personal simulation of the rival or of this person that we're copying in our minds, um, it can lead to some traumatic events if we perceive that rival to have negative feelings towards us. And so Rene Girard basically postulates that this mimetic theory can explain a lot of the mental illnesses and disorders of our time. Um, and it's not given its due credit. But let's look at, take a look at what would be good mimetic desire? What would be something that can help us? Um, it's actually a funny thing, but it's hypnosis. So if I quote um, one of the authors of 
Rene Girard's famous book, Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World, hypnosis was described as the character, caricature of mimetic desire, at once its simplest and strongest manifestation. And so we can see kind of the framework here where the person maybe tells the hypnotist, hey, I want to quit cigarettes. The hypnotist, in the state of hypersuggestibility that it induces, relays this desire onto the participant, saying, hey, I want you to quit, well, in this case, alcohol. Um, and then what Rene Girard and the accompanying interindividual psychologist would say is that that desire is imitated. Um, this person, this hypno hypnotist, becomes a high status model. And so that desire is imitated in the state of hypersuggestibility by the participant, by the subject, um, who then wishes it for himself. Um, he imitates this desire, which is for him to quit alcohol. And now we actually see, I'm starting to put the pieces together, a lot of, a lot of mirror neuron research within the field of hypnotists. So uh, this quote from the American Journal of Clinical Hypnosis basically says that uh, mirror neuron systems are potentially one of the founding mechanisms for creating the state of arousal that can lead to suggestion. Um, which is a pretty cool thing. And so when we put these pieces together, we have a basic foundation. And you'll notice there's no psychedelics yet. That's what we're getting to next. Um, where we have the mimetic theory connecting with the mirror neuron system, the mirror neuron system connecting with hypnosis and back to mimetic theory. We've created this triangle, but now let's put in psychedelics and see where that leads us. So what's funny enough is the actual subjective experience of hypnosis has been compared to psychedelics. Um, they've done studies where they'll even use the same mystical experience criterion that we use to classify a psychedelic experience and people undergoing a hypnotic trance will follow this. Um, similarly with the studies shown above, uh, they, they'll say they felt like it compared to their own psychedelic experiences. And these, these are just hypnosis images I looked up on Google, but they look pretty psychedelic, right? Yeah. Um, and, so, and so now we have this connection between hypnosis and, and psychedelics, at least on a bare, bare bones level. But now we're, we're also gonna found uh, a connection between mirror neurons and psychedelics. So in a recent paper, um, it was outlined that a hypothesis for why we have these visionary experiences is that due to the interruption of ordinary control mechanisms, due to this entropic brain, it creates visionary experiences from the mirror neuron system. Now, this is a, a phenomenal paper. I wish I could go into it further, but it's not where we end. This is just the beginning. Um, where it leaves off, though, is that it only talks about visionary experiences, does not give any credit or really address um, the factor of behavioral changes which at the end of the day is kind of why we're here in the psychedelic world is because of the, the amazing potential that these compounds have for behavioral changes. And so that's what we're gonna talk about. We, we've connected the mirror neuron system in some sense with psychedelics through this paper, therapeutic hypnosis in some sense through the suggestibility and the comparisons. Um, but let's make that last jump with mimetic theory. Let's see what it would look like for psychedelic therapy to fit the mimetic theory scheme that we've used for hypnosis. So here, here's an, an interesting way of looking at it. We have a person who has an intention for their experience. I should stop drinking alcohol. Going into an experience, they, they really want to quit. They've been an alcoholic for 20 years, and they're taking mushrooms in a, in a clinical trial to try to get over this addiction. Now, in a, in, a hip, in a hypnotist kind of worldview, this would go to the hypnotist. This desire would be expressed. The hypnotist would get it and put it down upon them in the state of suggestibility. But with psychedelics, maybe something else happens. Maybe that this, instead of the hypnotist, there's this embodied model. Uh, instead of the model or the person we copy being an external hypnotist, let's take a look at what if that model is actually the, the kind of embodied figure, the humanoid, the spirit, um, the, the visualized being that we have during these psychedelic experiences that we want to imitate. And so we can see that psychedelic therapy starts to look a little bit like hypnosis. And this leads us to the embodied model hypothesis which is compared to the mechanism of mimetic theory for hypnosis, where I express my desire to, to the hypnotist, they put me in a state of hypersuggestibility and they, I become imitatable or they become imitatable. I imitate their desire for me, which is to quit alcohol. In the embodied model hypothesis, what I'm suggesting potentially is following the same mechanism that's been outlined by Rene Girard and the inter, in, interdividual psychologist. Um, the psychedelic experience is taking this framework but it's happening cognitively. So potentially it would be, I have the intention to quit alcohol. I take some mushrooms and in having this intention, the disassociation between myself and, and this desire can create in the activation of the mirror neuron system can create this ultimate embodied model. This simulation of a person that is the most copyable 
And it goes along with these feelings of profound mystical experiences, almost godlike state where you feel like maybe you're talking to God. You feel like you're talking to um, some, some very mystical, uh, some mystical supernatural creature or, or a person or a humanoid, as we'll see later in the presentation. And that when they have this desire for you, maybe it's a vision, maybe it's a saying, telling you to maybe quit alcohol, showing you the vision of why it's bad for you. That imitation is actually the mechanism via which the behavior is adopted, not just an alternative perspective taking, which has kind of been hypothesized by many in the field. And so now let's take a look at the connections we've made. We have mimetic theory on one end, which is saying that we copy models and that's where we get our desires from. We have the mirror neuron system, which is the mechanism via which in our brain, this can happen. We can understand what the models want and we can embody that within ourselves. Therapeutic hypnosis is just a corollary for us to look at in relation to psychedelic induced behavioral change, where we have this external model with the sole purpose of creating therapeutic behavioral change on behalf of the patient. And then we have the, the psychedelic therapy induced behavioral change, which ties all these things together, which involves hyperactivity in the mirror neuron system, uh, follows the same framework, potentially is therapeutic hypnosis. Um, and, and if those things can align, um, bodes very well to potentially have some connection between mimetic theory in this the very powerful engine for creating behavioral change. Now, what, what would this actually look like? So if you were in a therapeutic setting, what would this be? What would this, how would we kind of test this? How would we figure this out? So let's work through a framework for internally in the mind, what could happen? And of course, this is like very bare bones, but for the sake of the presentation, please follow with me. So we have these harmful embodied models. Let's say there was a traumatic actor early in life that is causing a lot of distress. Um, it, it could be for a number of instances, maybe it was a, a, a harmful parent, maybe it was a, a third party causing a traumatic incident of violence. We don't know, but, but they're a traumatic actor who is, who is being simulated and is and remembered and embodied within the patient. Following this framework for inter-individual psychology, this embodied model of the actor is still there causing harm. Now, they, maybe they have anxiety or depression or, or, or an emotional disorder, but following this framework, here's me what, what it looked like. So we have this traumatic actor who is the number one model, the most salient model in the mind. But we can potentially replace this model with the, the ultimate embodied model. So the, the participant could really focus and, and create and, and look to expel this, uh, th this memory as we've seen kind of with the MDMA studies. Looking at PTSD, we, we see those MDMA therapy, the, those sessions, literally working on kind of expelling the, the models from them. In, in the movie Trip of Compassion, you can see in the sessions how they are moving out these traumatic actors from their life, literally sending them out of the brain, um, disregarding them, looking at them as weak, as low, as things to maybe bring them down on this kind of model hierarchy. But either way, um, the, hy the uh, hypothesis would state that these ultimate embodied models, the, the kind of God figures that we're trying to copy created by psychedelic experiences can replace the existing simulations in this mimetic hierarchy leading to positive behavior change. Because if we're following the desires and the, the intentions of um, the thing that is made for us to have the best possible life versus those of a traumatic actor, um, that, that maybe can explain not only uh, why we have positive benefits from these experiences, but why it's so versatile. And so now let's go back to those important questions. Um, th this hypothesis, now that we're kind of on a similar page, can maybe explain some of these things with more clarity. So the first one is why intention, right? We, we know that if you have bad intention, that you're in a bad set and setting, these things can really be traumatic. Maybe in the psychedelic community, it is, it is covered up. It's not talked about enough, but these bad trips can have lasting consequences. If you have a really, really bad, bad experience, people are traumatized, people can, it can lead to mental disorders um, in the worst cases. And, and when we control it, it goes well, but there's also a sign that it's not always positive. These things are are up to us to control and to interpret and, and to shift in the right direction, which helps us understand why intention is so important. So in this instance, why is a positive intention so important? Um, if, if this intention is going in, it is the de facto desire of this ultimate model, this ultimate simulation that we are copying and imitating. Now, if it's good, we see things like in this picture, quitting alcohol. They want you to quit alcohol, so you imitate it. Um, but we could also see if the desire was for you to you know, uh, maybe maybe to 
not like yourself, you're in a bad situation. These things can be amplified. If this desire is for you to, to find safety because you're scared and, and to run, um, we can see why people in these scary situations on psychedelics can really have these mind altering experiences for the worst. Uh, the second point is why the entropic brain can have second or, you know, it can have second or third order events, but this hypothesis, maybe it's not the, the only one, maybe it's not the best one in the game, um, but at least it's more specific. At least we can take uh, entropic brain and narrow it down to something that's very actionable in, in, the, in the framework or in the periphery of the human mind. Um, and not just saying we're gonna mix things up to the point where things will get better. This at least has a, an explanation for why this intention can create positive change versus just entropy creating uh, a, additional uh, revelations that can help you. Um, the third thing kind of answers the feeling of other, which is why these, why these psychedelic experiences can create this feeling of an anthropomorphization of entities and of other things. And it, it just kind of clicks with the model again, where you are constantly, uh, your mirror neuron system is active and you are creating persons, humanoids, human-like qualities as we see from the, the study on the left are constantly attributed to these psychedelic visions. And so this bodes well with the theory in the sense that uh, th these human-like figures are always or, or often present in psychedelic trips. Uh, and, and lastly, um, why are psychedelics potentially so versatile is also maybe because we can substitute out models. Um, it is not just a, a thing where we are treating a specific um, sort of illness. We're, we're tr treating a specific thing on the spectrum. If these, if these models and these simulations as individual psychology would suggest are, are a lot of the problem for what's causing these uh, mental disorders, then it would be, it's the next step is to see if we can substitute those out for better ones, maybe we can have solutions. I mean, following this framework, it would make sense in that sense at least. And so overall, we have a model where <laughs> there's a model and, and that model is what we copy. And we create that model with our best hopes in mind to be better people, to find love, um, to get over our fears. And if we imitate that model, we can do really great things and it can replace the, the bad actors that we maybe have currently stored in our mind, those little bad voices in our head telling us negative things. And uh, here's, here's what a session could look like. You know, we start with a, a harmful model reducing someone's well being. Maybe it's even just a, a dad telling a, a daughter that, you know, she's not good enough. And he never realized it, but she's just remembering this. You know, she just, it's, it's the simulation of, of the fathers in her mind. You know, if we can create an intention, visualize the, this ultimate embodied model, and displace that, that figure, displace that simulation um, and have her desire new things and have her feel different things about herself, um, we, we can have a unique or differentiated framework for looking at using psychedelics for the better. Um, it's not that this is the only solution. It's not that this is better than other solutions per se. It's that it's a different way of looking at it. And as we continue down the road, we're figuring out more and more about these compounds. We can hopefully uh, experiment with the different frameworks to see what works well. And so all in all, I mean, we, we really want to look at, you know, how does this model make us better? And, and I think that this general framework for what a session could look like can do the trick. Lastly, want to go over evaluation. Um, this is a hypothesis from a, a junior studying engineering. This is not uh, uh, anything uh, that I've, I've done empirical research on. There's been no testing of the hypothesis. It relies heavily on mimetic theory, which has severe lack of empirical research. Um, and, and so, and, and also is, is very esoteric in nature, not very well known. So the reception to it is, is low in general. Um, but I think the upside is that it can answer some questions that are skimmed over by grand unifying theories. Not even that uh, this is the only one that can do that, but, but specific, more intentional models for psychedelic um, behavioral changes, I think will be helpful in giving therapists tools that are usable instead of Bayesian analysis and free energy theory, which are helpful maybe for neuroscientists at the forefront. But for a therapist trying to do their job, maybe it's a little bit more difficult. And finally, that the esoteric nature of this can maybe explain the lack of exploration. This is a, a weird subject. And so it kind of helps us understand why maybe this hasn't come up yet. So some final words, just want to say thank you all for listening. Um, again, this is hypothesis untested. And, and I apologize for any uh, things that made me sound like I knew more than I was talking about. Um, but wanted to get this out there and to spark conversation around different ways and looking at the psychedelic experience. Thank you very much.